Bring your hand back in. You're cool with it. And mix it up and throw your head back and laugh for me one more time. <laughs> You are good. Fall over. Be funny, be funny. Yeah, dance, monkey, funny. dance. I'm not doing it. Exactly. Just make people laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Simple enough. Are you comfortable bringing your feet up, Bobby? Yeah. Okay, cool. Right there. Camel We're getting closer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. Give him a wet lily. I know we're all disabled, but that's kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> These veterans have been to hell and back on our behalf and now are about to go on a journey of a different kind. They'll be teamed up with nationally known comedians and comedy writers who will mentor them in crafting a, a short stand-up routine leading up to a live performance. Now I have the, the, the pleasure of introducing our five comedy warriors. Joe Cash now. Um, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I was uh, in the Army for six and a half years, retired as the rank of sergeant. Being in Iraq was a dichotomy of emotions. It was the worst experiences of my life, some of the best experiences of my life. So I remember we were driving down the road in the convoy. I was the trail vehicle. I was driving the truck, and I saw the road uh, explode right in front of me. As soon as the blast went off, and I looked down, and I saw there was a lot of blood on the front of my boot, and it was it just extremely painful. And the, uh, the flight medic asked me how I was feeling, and uh, I told him that it hurt quite a lot. and. Um, he said that uh, he was going to give me some Demerol, and I offered to marry him. When I first got home, and I was scared I would lose the leg, I did immediately try to deal with that by attempting to be funny. And they, they came in, they were talking to me and prepping me for surgery and telling me all the things that I could wind up expecting. I and I looked at them and I said, well, I have two things that I really need you guys to consider. Um, one, I'd like the leg returned to me so I can have it buried according to Orthodox Jewish tradition. And possibly even more importantly, if I'm fitted with a prosthetic, I want one with a secret cookie compartment. He sent this to the doctor, to the surgeon. I, I had a team of psychiatrists and psychologists come into my room the next day to discuss what was wrong with me. I was in shock. I was like, I'm trying to use humor to get through the worst situation I've ever been in and hopefully will ever be in. He, he always used humor to, to get past a lot of things, especially when he was recovering. And I'm sure it helped him a great deal. And to some people around them, around him, it probably helped them too. Didn't help me to hear him say stuff like that. It was not easy at all, and, and my mother would say things to me like, how can you joke about having one leg gone? I said, Ma, this is what he's got to do. What's my it? latest joke is that I'll be sitting up. I'll be sitting up like this, and I'll lean back like this. I'm like, oh, my legs are stuck. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Rob Jones. I'm a sergeant in the Marine Corps. I went to Iraq in 2008 and Afghanistan in 2010. I had a metal detector and I was kind of looking around using my eyes. And, you know, I just stepped on it. Uh, I missed it. When I first got hit, I knew that at least part of my legs were going to be gone. I checked my hands. Um, you know, I checked between the legs. Uh, made sure that stuff was good. Then they told me that both were below the knee, but from the infections and everything, they ended up having to amputee above the knee. 
Well, I knew that my mom was going to be devastated. So I was just trying to think of a way to kind of lighten it a little bit. When I was rolling off the ambulance, my mom would see my legs first. And then she, when I rolled the rest of the way out, she would see this pirate hat on my head for no reason. And then I just figured she would laugh, you know, it's, and that would just kind of help with the initial shock. Someone was asking, like, when do we know each other for? It's like, no, we just, you just know, you know? Yeah, exactly. We've all been through something the same, just the military alone and, yeah. you know, being hurt and going through all this hospital stuff to go there. I don't know about you guys, but, yeah. like, surgeries, oh, I freak out for a surgery. Yeah. You want to send me back to Iraq, put me in a Humvee, let's go. Right. <laughs> but i got a surgery right. coming up, I'm freaking out. Yeah. Like, <laughs> How many have you had total? 45. Oh, Lord. I've only had five. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's like that. No, I hurt my back due to the aircraft. You know, just insufficient seating and the vibrations, and it sort of just caught up with me when I was in Iraq. So because I was there, there was nothing I could do. I wasn't at a major American post. I was in Erbil uh, with Koreans. So I could do acupuncture, but, you know, <laughs> no MRI, no nothing like that. So when I got home, you know, I was kind of expecting the red carpet to be laid out for me. I sucked <laughs> it up like I was supposed to. And here comes the good medical treatment. And instead, I was told that pain was part of life and to suck it up. And that really pissed me off. The first um, few years... Sorry, I'm pregnant, all right? <laughs> How's that going for your back? Yeah, oh, let me tell you. <laughs> I've tr really tried, done everything <laughs> that you can imagine for, for healing. You know, obviously, I've done multiple rounds of physical therapy, opiates, um, which I did way too much of. I've had, like, over 30 different pain management injections, whether they're epidurals or I had facet injections, nerve ablations. You know, I'm a... I'm an expert. I was a human pin cushion. She was on the pain medicine and that seemed to work. That seemed to help her. She was her normal self or it seemed to be her normal self. And then she be, became an addict following that. There was a very specific moment where I decided to take more Oxycontin than was prescribed. It was sort of a F it moment for me. <laughs> it, was, it was very difficult going through trying to get off the medicine and some of the side effects from that. Right now, for uh, to help my pain and to get through the day, especially in pregnancy, spinal cord stimulator. And for me, it's not fixing the injury; it's just pain management at this point. Every hurdle, every every struggle along the way, she incorporated a lot of humor and talked openly about it and wasn't afraid. With you know the injury, if people number one, they don't know and they're afraid to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Right. If you, if you right. can, right. if you can have a um, kind of a sick sense of humor about it, <laughs> it's going to make them open up. And some of my best friends, it came just from you know, the first time we talked, you know, well, Steve got hurt, but it starts with that first conversation about, you know, what happened, and if you can joke about it, man, it makes, it makes it easier, and, you know, they're like, okay, so he's fine with it, so I can ask more questions. I was 22 years old when we arrived in Iraq. Uh, we received a, I received a call on the radio saying that another military police patrol had been um, hit by a roadside bomb. At that point, I told you know, the rest of my soldiers, I'm gonna go forward, watch my back, I'm gonna go see if I can help out and assess what's going on. So as I start running down a, um, a highway on-ramp, a secondary uh, IED goes off, an improvised explosive device. And when that bomb went off, I, I, I knew immediately what was happening. Uh, kind of get picked up in the air, I'm tumbling, I end up landing on my back, and I did kind of a uh, like a half sit up and I looked down at my, my legs to see if my legs are still there. And uh, I could tell that my left boot looked like a big piece of hamburger. So at that point I decided, you know, maybe I should just lay here and just not do anything. Get checked into the hospital really quick and the doctors are doing their immediate life-saving triage. And I still haven't passed out at this point. And I remember Jay and I, we kind of had this on and off again tumultuous relationship where, you know, he's the seasoned NCO and I'm the I'm the young, stupid lieutenant, so we sort of butted head, heads a lot. The thing, that, the thing that killed me the most about that whole situation was when we got to, the, when we got to the, the hospital, Jay comes in and he grabs a bottle of sterile water and some gauze, and he tips it over, and he says, uh, he's like, Lieutenant, you look like shit. And he starts cleaning the mud and the shit off of my face. And it was, uh, 
It's good. It's good. Passed out. For the next year, you know, mentally I was not in a very good place. Um, I wanted to be back in Iraq with my people. I wanted to be a functional human being, which wasn't happening. I think that's where a lot of guys get hung up as they kind of get into that rut of they define who they are by their injury. If you're not able to move past that, then I don't really think that you're healing. I didn't know that Steve was an amputee until probably six months after I started working at the agency. And I remember him getting up and shouting, I'm looking for a foot. Does anyone see a left foot? And I remember thinking, that's weird. And everyone's laughing. And I'm like, I don't really think that's, you know, funny. And then someone was like, oh, he's, you know, he's an amputee. And I said, no, I didn't know that. And I thought, well, that's funny. He can make fun of, you know, he can make fun of it. And you can either let those emotions from the day-to-day -day grind, like, beat you down and just be angry all the time or you can you can let that come out at certain times laughing it's a way to let that steam cap off and it just makes you feel better well when i first heard about comedy warriors healing through humor i wish i'd come up with the idea myself what a cool idea to take veterans people who've been injured and using humor to heal i think comedy is a good um uh, therapy on just the level of therapy it's a long transition back and um, this hopefully makes it an easier process. When something hurts to talk about, if you keep talking about it, it stops hurting. That's what a comic does every single night when they go up there and they talk about something. My initial reaction when I heard about this is, haven't they been through enough? <laughs> um, a very happy, well-adjusted people don't go into stand-up. It's, it's a way of dealing with, with pain, insecurity, um, fear. I mean, it really is a healing kind of thing at its best. I think that humor is often looked at as not the way we should be when we're talking about these issues. And it should be. It's very, very helpful. I was in the Army. I actually did four tours in Iraq, including Desert Storm, an old guy. I love my job. I love going on my tours. But I got to say, that last tour in 07 was a blast. <laughs> Thank you. I started off in Desert Storm when I was 19 years old. I got out of the Army for 10 years and then came back in the Army after 9-11. And then that, when the vehicle lined up with a the tire they had on the side of the road, he knew that was the spot. And then he detonated by hand the explosion. It actually threw the Humvee um, upside down 20 meters, and it slid upside down. Uh, on, of course, catching on fire. 38% uh, of my body was burnt, full thickness, um, through tissue and everything. My head was actually burnt to the skull. I had my left hand at that point. I had it for two years and decided to, to take it off. You know, when I woke up in the hospital in Texas, the first thing the doctor says to me, are you ready to see your wife? And I thought, wow, doc, don't you think I've been through enough? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in the beginning, I got really insecure with the relationship. I didn't know how she could still love me for the way I looked. And she was just, you know, stayed by my side and kept reassuring me, I'm here, I love you, it's still you inside there, and she sees that. We have great kids, we have, you know, a, a good life, we have a beautiful home. Our life is so normal, except for the fact people aren't used to what he looks like. The first time that me and my me and my family and my dad like left the house it was like a proud moment for me. But at first everybody was staring and I got defensive. Why are you looking at him like this wasn't his choice? And it was it was hard for me. Cause I know him. I think he looks great. Sometimes I will forget because I'm so much of, of me inside that I forget. Like when I dream, I'm dreaming I got two hands and run around, I look like the old me. I don't see any of this. And, and there's days I'm having a good day and I forget <laughs> what I look like. And then I get my car and I'm listening to the radio, jamming, and I pull into Walmart and as soon as I get out of the car and there's all these looks, like, oh yeah, you know? And so when I see someone staring, I'll wave, I'll say hi, I catch them off guard a little bit or talk to kids. And using that humor just really helped break the ice. I am a burn survivor. 
Thank you, I've been extinguished for years. I remember even from the first time that my brother and my sister saw him, you know, like they're like, oh, what happened to your ear? And he's like, what, I don't have an ear? I think he's always just used his humor and it makes us more comfortable. Yeah, it makes me more comfortable too because I know they're uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable with them staring. <laughs> so if I can break the ice for both of us and, and make, make a joke about it, then it, it helps me just as much as it helps somebody else. And, and, and after talking with me for a few minutes, they don't see that anymore and they see who's inside. When I first started off doing comedy, I get the, all these emails that I find out, hey, there's this comedy warriors that want to train wounded warriors to be comedians. Like, oh my God, I can use all the help I can get. Hi, I'm on Skype. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, Bob. I, I wanted to introduce you to four of our comedy warriors. Bob, you have any uh, words of wisdom to uh, our group here? Here, I'll uh, show you a little bit of how to do it. Um, this is just something you could do if you if you wanted to, I have, you know, on the, on the and this is not an ad for iPhone because I have a feeling we'd have a better connection if I was on it right now. <laughs> Here's like a new hour of material I'm working on, and it's just a memo pad that I just spin through. I just spin through jokes, and if I stop on one, um, here's a joke. I had pneumonia. That was the girl's name. <laughs> a lot of people have had her. <laughs> So the comedy is uh, is hard, but what you people are doing is uh, is braver than <laughs> just me flying to Orlando and going on stage to make college kids laugh. <laughs> Bob, thanks a lot. My pleasure. Best of luck to all of you. Thanks for uh, thanks for wanting to talk to me. Thank you, thanks, Bob. Bob. Thank, Thank you so much. Bob. I think what I'm most looking forward to is ending up with an act that I, I know is funny and will make people laugh whenever I do it. I'm looking forward to working with the writers because I have no idea how to write an effective joke. We pair each one of these comedy warriors with professional writers. Ray had worked with a lot of these writers, so we try to match personalities and the type of style and sense of humor with each one. I think you guys just talk about what, you know, what you got, what do you, what do you feel like you want to talk about, Steve, in your stand-up, and then uh, what I said to Bob is then you can got, you guys can start like an email dialogue. They come up with a lot of good premises, but I don't always know how to, uh, you know, write it up in order to present it. We can work together and I can help you craft stuff and write stuff like that. And any premise you're thinking of, just tell me about it. Talk about the things that, that you care about, because that's what's going to come through to an audience. And then you can also do stuff about your baby, because babies are funny, you know? Like the first time they poop, you know, you get those seeds that kind of come in there, and I didn't know what the fuck that was. You, ever, you know what I'm talking about? I do, I do. Yes, I do. I watched his stuff, and he's, uh, he's good. He is, he is. He's the better joke writer right now than he is a performer. So we're going to try to hook in uh, Bobby right now. Yes. There you go, there you go, you're on. Okay. All right, and uh, Kevin, I don't know if you have that on your end, but... It's like radio. Bobby, I'm going to make a big radio star. Let's do it. I got a face for radio. Ooh. <laughs> well, that's just a still picture for now. Oh, my hey, goodness. Hey, How you doing, Mama? <laughs> Pretty good. Ready to have this baby. Uh, you know, Drew Carey always was in a suit with his glasses. Stephen Wright was always with the crazy hair that you could, you could pinpoint <laughs> people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, you know, you have the fortunate but unfortunate uh, fact of your uh, physical appearance and how you came to be who you are. That's a very powerful story. So I wouldn't shy off of it because it's unique. You don't want to just become somebody doing bits. Right. You want to be like a storyteller, you know? Th that's another approach. If you want to do one, you know, there's one-liners, you can mix it all up. I don't know if you do voices. I mean, for me, it took me five years to figure out who I was on stage. In the comedy writing, we pushed to go to areas that maybe felt uncomfortable to get more authenticity, because that's where the humor is, that contrast between pain and laughter. Some of it, you know, I was telling her, I'm like, I'm just kind of bitter about this. So, you know, that's where I think the collaboration really helps. It is therapeutic. It's like, you're right, I, I need to give that up and laugh about that a little bit. So. <laughs> but it's rewarding to watch the progress of people, and that's what I'm really looking forward to with you. I just can't wait to help you write stuff and to see you do it.
It's a workshop, it's a stand-up workshop in essence, which is a really fast-track way to learn how to do stand-up. Doing comedy with a coach is much easier than doing it by yourself because I had to self-teach rather than having somebody help me do it. Sitting around doing it and then having a group of people that you can sit around and talk to about and, and getting their input as to what worked and why. And I, I hate this. <laughs> you hate it, you I, love I, it. I love doing it. Well, yeah. But I, I hate like waiting to get up there to do it. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, keep your hands going for Rob Jones. Okay, Rob, we don't have all day, Rob. <laughs> Eventually, I'm going to get off that thing without mooning everybody. <laughs> I am a wounded veteran. Uh, I get thanked a lot for being wounded, but I really got to give most of the credit for that to the terrorist that planted that landmine. He really did do all the work. All I really did was step there when I should have stepped, well, anywhere else in the world probably would have been fine. So you're probably wondering what the hell I am doing up here calling myself a wounded warrior. Sinking in now. She's the crazy one. <laughs> the third question I'm usually asked after, what's your name, where are you from, is what happened to your leg? And the first time I tell them well, I was in Iraq and I was injured by a roadside bomb in 2003. And by the 17th time I'm asked that question, before I can come up with a straight answer, little comedy voices in my head take over. And before I can say anything, I just hear, say shark attack, say shark attack. <laughs> but I wasn't injured in a shark attack. Tom was a sand shark. Desert is lousy with sand sharks. Yeah, you know, uh, everybody wants to know, like, what it's like to get blown up. And I'm like, what are you, fucking retarded? It hurts like hell. It's kind of like getting punched in the balls 12 times. It didn't hurt enough, the extra two were just for kicks. <laughs> Over the uh, last five years, I've had over 45 skin graft surgeries. And I don't know if you guys know what skin graft surgeries are. Basically, they take the good skin, they replace the burnt skin, like essentially they make a skin cloth out of you. I've had so many skin grafts, I can't even tell my ass from my elbow these days. <laughs> it's a great night in LA. Great night for a date. Anybody here out on a date right now? <laughs> yeah, date with yourself. Guys, you got your condoms? Yeah, you got your condoms. Because guys, we're optimists. And bringing a condom on a date is pretty much the most optimistic thing a guy can do. I mean, you're just getting ready. Like, oh, I'm going to need this later. But you got to play it right. You can't just be like, yeah, I have my condom right here. Like, what do you mean you have it right there? Do you expect sex tonight? Well, no. Uh, I mean, I, I've just had it. Oh, so you're going to use a condom that you meant for another girl. God damn it, no. <laughs> that was all good. I was just trying to think if there was a way to reveal that you'd been wearing one the whole time during the day. <laughs> like when you uh, do the bit about having a condom, that's great. It's a great area. It's a, it's a totally true hypocrisy that you're pretending someone's really special, and yet you were prepared to meet anybody special. That's funny. But the audience knows where it's going. So that's the time, I think, to think of What's a really good excuse that a guy could give? And then what's a really good hole that a girl could poke in that excuse? How long have you been doing stand-up? That's what I would ask. Well, last night was my second time doing it for a crowd. Seriously? Yeah, uh, but um, like the fifth or sixth time doing it for how, anybody. How long uh, have you been in the service? Uh, I was in five and a half years. Uh, well, I'm so, retired now. Well, right. Stand-up is just a bunch of pussy bullshit. <laughs> My first time seeing these guys um, was... Uh, I, I was actually surprised at how accomplished they, had, they were for how very little time they've been doing stand-up. I walked into the club, I sat down in a chair, and all of a sudden everybody got up and performed. And I was surprised that I was so comfortable right from the moment they took stage. I was... Uh really st stunned by the level of confidence. I mean, that's 
just for starters. That's, for me, that was the hardest thing as a comic. Such a big part of it, as stage presence and, and being able to hold your own uh, uh, on stage. I, I didn't have that for a long time, and uh, I'm always in, pissed off when I see people have it naturally. After I think you've been in Afghanistan or Iraq, no audience can scare you. <laughs> to say the word brave feels, um, feels kind of silly about something like this, but they face that, you know, bombing isn't gonna scare them, this kind of bombing. I've, uh, I'm very excited to tell you, I've, uh, I've recently written a book. Oh boy. It's a, uh, it's a program on how to lose weight. Um, and it's, it's a very good program. Uh, guaranteed success, no exercise, no special diet. Guaranteed to lose weight, or I will personally refund your money. And you'll never hear a Jew say that. <laughs> Basically, each chapter, is another body part you don't need. I lost 25 pounds when I had my leg off, and two weeks ago I lost another five and a half ounces when I had my gallbladder out. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just go on camera. Uh, can I have a close up? Uh, I just frown on those Jew jokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have, uh, you, you know, this is gonna be a horrible thing to say. You have a leg up on a lot of people right now. <laughs> Because you're Jewish, so it's. The <laughs> you could also say you're Jewish, and they circumcised your knee. What was the um, this, the the weight loss? I lost 25 pounds. When I had my leg. Yeah. What's the next one? Um, and I lost another four and a half ounces when I had my gallbladder out. Okay. And I'm losing about an ounce a day watching porn. I like that. <laughs> and my favorite part about what you're doing is that I really feel that if we were just hanging out, you would talk the exact same way. And that is the hardest thing to, to learn. You seem like a kind of guy that would be a very good storyteller. And you know, obviously a lot of this art form is, is telling stories. Where the joke part of it can sometimes get in the way of the humor because there's really something funny about just being completely, just talking about all this stuff that you guys have been through. You have a tendency to do, you write it down, but then you fucking digress. You kind of digress a little. Don't tell me you write it all down because you kind of go into your little space. Don't all of it. It's all written down? All of it. You really need psychiatric help. I do. <laughs> Jesus, that, that fucking <laughs> unbelievable. You write the digressions out. I've never heard of that. You know, I'm Doris Smith, blah, blah, blah. Or should I just A lot of the material, we talked about it was pretty dark stuff, you know, like addiction and um, and bitterness. But she would encourage me. She's like, "That's okay. That's where good comedy comes from." <sighs> How's everybody doing? My name is Doree Smith. This is Peanut Smith. No. <laughs> when I was in Iraq, I lived with a division of South Korean soldiers for 11 months, and I ate nothing but fish heads and kimchi. So, <laughs> oh crap, I just forgot my joke. <laughs> no, so kimchi is really nasty. Uh, I would have really screwed Ronald McDonald for a hamburger. Actually, I would have screwed Wendy for a hamburger. <laughs> You're doing the commentary again. Okay. You yeah. know, and that's just, we know from yeah. practicing alone and the attitude that we were gonna yeah. kind of work we'll on. Right. Yeah. Not like, hey, do you yeah. like this joke? But right. hey, I'm telling you a story and yeah. it doesn't matter what you, whether you're along. Right, right, yeah, definitely. Stand right. in one place, stand okay. strong. Yeah. I just like that you're talking about um, your experience, honestly. Uh, that, that's, because, because your experience is so unique, I, I just, I, uh, the more of that stuff I can hear, the more I, I like it. The most difficult thing about doing stand-up is, uh, is bringing the personality that you have when you're sitting around with a group of people in a room, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, if you're just sitting around a table mm -hmm. and they're screaming, laughing, and then you get on stage, mm -hmm. and uh, all of a sudden it's, what the fuck happened right. to the person <laughs> sitting at the table? I think mm -hmm. that you're getting caught up with being up there. Yeah, yeah. If you just tell it as your fucking story. Right. Here's my fucking story, you fucks. <laughs> right. Fuck that. <laughs> just tell it. It's your right. story. Yeah. You should see the other guy. 
Yes, I am a burn survivor. Thank you. I've been extinguished for years. Thank you. I don't know if you guys know this, but you know, burn survivors, we have our own wave. It's kind of like the Jeep wave, you know, it's not a real big secret or anything. We all learn it the day we get burned. You know, it kind of goes like this. <laughs> Thanks for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. This is about as horrifying a, a, a way to do comedy as I can imagine. You know, me sitting here and you sitting there. <laughs> but your opening, you can make, is a million dollar opening. Okay, because you can see, you should see the other guy. If you take all the fucking time you want, you can take fucking a decade before just you. Get them all nice and awkward. <laughs> just get them as awkward as those fucks. Make them fucking go through the last 10 fucking years. Those fucking morons didn't pay any attention, pieces of shit. Okay? And uh, boy, if that's on film, that's the end of my career. <laughs> I told my wife before I left to Iraq, I said, honey, if I don't come home in one piece, I want you to go on without me. Luckily, her and her new husband let me rent out the garage. <laughs> so horrible. <laughs> oh, jeez, that's funny. I didn't really think it was going to work. I thought it could work with us. Maybe I could talk to the wounded warrior or stuff like that. But there's no way I can go out and get the general public especially with the war still going on, to go up there and tell them what happened to me and make them laugh about it. All right, I'm Steve Rice. Since I don't know you guys, I should probably address the whole uh, leg thing. Back in 2003, I uh, was involved in a pretty aggressive study abroad program with uh, the United States Army in Baghdad, Iraq. It didn't fucking go well. <laughs> One thing you do that's great uh, right from the start is you, you refer to your leg right away, but it wasn't just that you did that. It was you had this tone of, I know what you're all thinking, and that sets everyone at ease. So always think, what are they thinking, and be the guy that has the balls to say it. It's very interesting, all this the, the stuff and getting that out there about, you know, your, your injury and thing, but I wouldn't cater your material mostly to that. I would just move on past that. You have, that, that way you're not, painting yourself into a corner of right. just being the, the comic that, that uh, served uh, time overseas. I was just thinking about <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, the it didn't go well joke. Like if you did it even stronger and a little bit angrier, I think it would get an even bigger laugh because it was a really, it was, it was such a funny moment to me. I just, re <laughs> I agree it just really made me laugh because I, I could see the, um, I could see in your eye that you were like even angrier than you were letting on. I just sort of saw that, um, that little bit of an edge of a guy who's a little bit pissed off. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I like that, you know? That, that makes for good comedy. It's kind of like a baby panda. You know, they can be cute and cuddly, but if you touch them the wrong way, they're going to claw your damn face off. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. I can take out the, the, the hemorrhoid story easily. Because that's a joke that I'm not overly confident in. Why the end called the loincloth? I'm going to figure out why. Is it unnecessary or is it something I need to do to make it better? It's going the right direction. <laughs> yeah. It could be getting fucking worse. If, if I thought it was something I would potentially want to use uh, in front of people, I sent it. Everything. You know, um, and I felt confident that if it sucked, he was going to tell me, or if it was good, he let me know as well. I always felt like talking to the audience was a waste of time, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, but some people are great at it. That's and, kind of my you know. nervous habit, and I stray. Where are you know. from? Yeah. Right now, I'm in Los Angeles doing some more stand up comedy. <laughs> that I would send him jokes that I had written or premises that I had. And some of Rob's material that I would read, if, it was, if I thought it was really great, I would put it on Facebook and say it was mine. I hope <laughs> that's okay. My father used to, and, and he still does, tell jokes. But I don't think he's ever told one properly, um, which is which is great. Uh, my brother told him a joke that uh, you know his high school team was named the Nads, and every time they'd run out on the field, they'd go they'd yell, "Go Nads!" Oh, I, I tried to tell that joke so many times; it was, it was absolutely ridiculous. I don't even remember how I messed it up, but I know I sure messed it up every time. 
Or I would go out there yelling, yay, Nads. And people would look at me like, well, what's funny? I said, oh, yeah, go, Nads, go, Nads. Yeah. And then they look at you like you're a real jerk. <laughs> That's why I don't do stand-up and Joe does. We're here for uh, Comedy Warriors. It's a very exciting project. They're uh, showcasing uh, traumatic injured veterans who uh, are using humor to heal. And their tagline, healing through humor, is very moving and very motivating. And I'm still a little pissed they've rejected my tagline, come out and laugh at the handicapped. <laughs> Dealing with pain is the most difficult thing I've ever had to negotiate around. Um, Pain that's uncontrollable is, uh, by definition, painful and miserable and exhausting and overwhelming and can take over every facet of your life. And when I lost joy in doing anything, I couldn't even enjoy sitting around and playing with uh, my newborn son and just watching him uh, discover new toys or new sounds or whatever it was. I, I really wondered what was the point. I started seriously contemplating suicide. Suicide is the only option for people whose pain outweighs their coping mechanisms. And if, if I'm not even getting any joy out of the, the greatest experience of life, then why am I still bothering? And I realized that I was still bothering because he deserved to have a dad around. You know how I know the government's running out of money? Last year, I applied for a social security disability. Got denied. Twice. Yeah, that, that's logical. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. The reason they gave me was my condition was not expected to continue for over 12 months. <laughs> which was good. Uh, that's good news. <laughs> I'm expecting some growth here soon. <laughs> At first, when my mobility was severely limited by being in a wheelchair, it's a little bit easier to get downtrodden about, you know, this sucks, I can't do anything. And I just talked about it with uh, my friend at the time. I don't really f feel sorry for myself anymore, but it's just that release of what you're bottling up that makes you you know, kind of be like, okay, yeah. I'd never rode before injury. It turns out that there was a program in DC that teaches people how to row uh, without legs. I was pretty good, so we kept going with it, and I was competing. And now I'm going to see if I can make the national adaptive rowing team. The only way to find out what you are capable of is to try and do something that you want to do. I'm 60% disabled from post-traumatic stress disorder. But you get a lot of anxiety and you get stressed out, different situations, the unknown. Um, like when at a grocery store. I go to the same grocery store all the time here and I know where everything's at in that store. I can make my list according to the way I maneuver through the store. And I have to start in the back and work my way forward. And I have to do routines. Otherwise, my anxiety kicks in. The, the heart starts racing. I feel numb, like I'm in this own world. And just everything around me, it just feels like you're being held down. I'll get anxious about certain things. Um, it could be even driving in traffic or trying to get to the airport on time or dealing with uh, just stressors in the household. It's a fight, I think, to constantly uh, try to keep that in check, you know, the protective side. and. It's easy to bubble up and um, get angry about stuff. Without a doubt, I have some form of, of PTSD, and it's, uh, it can, it's considered an anxiety disorder, which is why I have issues with uh, large groups. Some of the techniques that uh, my therapist and I have been working on to deal with uh, stressful situations, I was also using just to deal with the nervousness of waiting to go on stage. And they help, the, you know, the deep breathing exercises, they help calm me down a little bit. I know that there's obviously some dark, dark hours that these gentlemen have spent, and there's no, is, it, it, to find a funny way of telling that to the audience is a, is, a, is a real art form. In case you're wondering, yes, the carpet matches the drapes. <laughs> <laughs> but it still works. 
Right, guys? If it didn't work, I wouldn't be up here telling jokes. Nothing would be funny. <laughs> and of course, you're going to ask when you're the sole survivor, why me? Here I was, the old guy, been doing this for years, and you got these young kids in the vehicle with you, and, and you're the one that lives. You, know, you got the, the guilty feeling for that. I wanted to not let the guys down that didn't make it. You know, if I sat there and was mad about everything every day and felt sorry for myself and just hid in my house and turned away from my family, um, I'd be letting them down. I gotta live my life to the fullest because that's what they sacrificed for, for our country to be able to do that. <laughs> I have to say, there's a part, a part of me was really nervous. I was going, oh, fuck. This is the worst position to be in. I'm going to be sitting in the audience. Not I'm not worried about the three of you. You've been through hell and back, and I'm worried about, well, fuck, I got to get up. I got to walk three blocks. You know, it's, and it's also, I mean, I have empathy because it's, we, we're, it's really weird for you, but it was great. God, I mean, it was really fun, which is good because it could have made for a long day. <laughs> <laughs> it was it, it was awesome because it doesn't I, I don't know you you make a, somebody off the street laugh and that's fine but somebody who's been in this industry for uh, what 30 35 years and he finds what you're saying funny is it's just incredible I think it helped energize me again you know in comedy's like is this going to work and, you know am I still working at it and you see that and you see the energy from these guys when we feed off each other to bring it up to the next level. We challenge each other and we're given those tools um, by these A-list comedians, the writers helping us out, tweak stuff a little bit here and there. Well, the best advice I've ever gotten in stand-up is what my dad told me, and I don't know how he knew, because he's not a stand-up, but he once told me, only tell the jokes that you like and only keep the jokes that they like. And that's kind of always been my compass. You don't want to tell a joke that you don't like but you think they'll think is funny, because when that bombs, you feel like the biggest piece of shit in the world. I remember I was doing a show and I, I was like, God, I've been doing these jokes that I don't really even like, but I'm gonna try to, you know, the things that made my friends laugh and make me laugh. I, and I hate to sound so cavalier about it, but fuck the audience. Just do what you think is funny. My main advice to anyone who wants to do this is that you do it you just get up as often as you can, whenever you can, and do it over and over and over again. It's like anybody that does any kind of writing, just re rewrite it, rethink it, re redo it. Get up on stage, just keep, keep doing it. It's the only way. It's just find that hometown club and go up as much as you can, every chance you can, and it will happen. You have to just get on stage, you have to, and there's, there's terrible shows and, and to Realize that a lot of times it's not your fault for um, not doing well. It's just the, the geography of the room. It's really hard to tell a joke in a cemetery. I ate nothing but fish heads and kimchi. I would have screwed Ronald McDonald for a hamburger. I would have screwed Wendy for a hamburger. Is sex better after divorce? You're having sex with a person whose guts you don't hate. I would say, yeah, that's better. He's like, hey, Lieutenant Rice, why are you not speaking the Arabic? Arabic is a beautiful language. English is shitty fucking English. Like, knock it off. He's like, what's wrong with you? So I have PTSD. So well, you should have wore a condom. <laughs> I've done a bunch of public speaking before, and um, you know, you're always afraid when you get up there that the audience is just going to laugh at you. And now I'm afraid the audience isn't going to laugh at me. stage is it's pretty fucking cool. Everybody inside that little room in there is expecting to laugh when you talk. That's a lot of pressure, but I think uh, after our rehearsal today, it's gonna go really well. The Burning Man wave. 
tech light. <laughs> you know, you realize if he steals jokes, he is a one-armed bandit. Yep. Yeah, should be should be fine as long as I say everything right. If you stay around his matter anyway, right. just go with it. Yeah. And if you fall down, it's okay too. I'm gonna be right there for you. Yeah. I'm gonna pick you up. As long up. as I don't fall down, that'll be everything will be fine. <laughs> I'm gonna put you back in the nest. All right, next time I come on the stage, guys, is your first comedian warrior of the night. Everyone that's very funny. Rob Jones, everybody. Thank you very much. Everybody having a good time tonight so far? Good, good. It's great to be here in LA, the city where 50% of the people are actors or 50% of the people are realizing that they're not gonna be actors. Yeah. <laughs> I was reading a study and they found that kiwi makes your semen taste better. Now, I understand why they would want to figure that out. I mean, the ability to go up to a girl, ask her her favorite food, and tell her your semen tastes exactly like it, <laughs> it's a huge leg up. <laughs> but I just don't know how they're going about discovering these things. This is just like two guys in a lab, two cups of semen just sitting there. <laughs> One of us is gonna have to. <laughs> All right. Ah, shit, shit. All right, here we go. Okay. Whew. Ooh, that's not a kiwi. That's not bad. <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty good. It's like a smoothie. It's delicious. They go out to the streets, they take it out to the streets, like one of those Coke Pepsi taste tests. Excuse me, ma'am. Would you please put on this blindfold and tell us which mystery liquid tastes better? <laughs> but then I was reading in a book later, and in that book they said that if you have diabetes, your urine smells and tastes like sugar. <laughs> Who are the people that are just volunteering? You know, I'm gonna, <laughs> gonna see what this stuff tastes like. <laughs> uh, they, they have the guy there, he's going, all right, to subject number one. <laughs> oh, no, you don't have diabetes, you're fine. <laughs> <sighs> you're a very healthy individual. <sighs> Been eating a lot of asparagus. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell, I can tell. All right, give me, give me the next one, all right. Ooh, oh, that's not bad. <laughs> Sir, you are severely diabetic. <laughs> oh, you probably got about two weeks to live, but this is delicious. Give me that vodka, I got a mixer here. <laughs> all right, that's it for me, thanks. sure how well it was going to over. It went over a lot better than I thought, though. Better than I was expecting. Everybody was really receptive. Thank you. How does it feel? Good. Good. It's a little, I admit, a tad nervous going up, but... You didn't see it. You didn't oh, yeah. see it at all. I mean, that much. Not even. Dude, you're like uh, the fucking best. Hey, thanks for coming, too. No, thanks for... Mark, thanks for having me now, man. Don't you love it, though? Yeah. I mean, it, it's like a feeling like... like you know? You have so much... You have so much more stuff, though. You know? I mean, I've read, like, three solid pages, which is, you know, single space, solid pages. He's probably got a half an hour that he, he could do if he wanted to. Okay. She's eight months pregnant. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Are you ready to rock? I want you to put your hands together for Miss Dory Smith. Yeah. 
baby. How's everybody doing? All right. Yeah. So like you said, my name is Doree Smith, and I'm involved in a program called Comedy Warriors. Now, you might be looking at me and saying, um, yeah, why is she standing up here? <laughs> Just to be clear, this is not my combat injury. <laughs> I was a good girl growing up. I was the president of my, president of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I didn't party, didn't drink, didn't do drugs, didn't believe in premarital sex. My idea of a good time was hanging out with my Southern Baptist youth group, singing praise songs, and playing I Never with cups of iced tea. <laughs> if we really wanted to get crazy, we'd start singing and dancing to Amy Grant, that divorcee. <laughs> I am a recovering addict for a year now. <laughs> Just in time. <laughs> <laughs> I discovered that insanity and addiction go hand in hand. I would hear these stories about people robbing pharmacies. I'd say, that's a really good idea. <laughs> So I'd have these fantasies of storming down the aisles, swallowing all the pills I could get, and washing it down with NyQuil. <laughs> but then my Southern Baptist upbringing would uh, come in, I'd start feeling guilty. <sighs> I forgot to say grace. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> performing like I you probably seriously you're gonna see like this punching out because he's like yeah let's go let's go you know you give her a note and she takes them well she yeah. incorporates she them. Shoot. yeah just tell yeah. Judd Apatow that and I'll be right yeah I mean that's that's a uh, mark of a good actor yeah it was a lot of fun I'm you know it, it, like they were saying you know you kind of want to you're like okay can I go again you know it's it's really addictive and give big, a big hand for Steve Rice give right. me that Thank you. What is up, guys? A good night so far? I am Steve Rice. I figured it would be good to uh, start this night by explaining the reason for why I only have five feet, five feet, five toes. <laughs> See, back in uh, December of 2003, it's a pretty interesting story. I was involved in a uh, pretty aggressive study abroad program between the United States Army and uh, the country of Iraq. <laughs> and uh, as you can see, uh, it didn't fucking turn out too well, okay? You know, ever since I lost this leg, it's been uh, kind of hard to keep weight off. So this, uh, this year I made a New Year's resolution, I dropped 20 pounds. It's pretty aggressive, pretty aggressive. But I decided to get there by buying the uh, P90X DVD series off TV. Have you guys seen it? <laughs> P90X rock! <laughs> P90X, you know that somebody in the front row here, you've probably been sitting on your couch at like 4.30 in the morning all pissed off because your guy just got voted on Survivor. So you're like shoving like Ben and Jerry's ice cream into your mouth. P90X comes on, P90X rock. Because P90X, they tell you that if you do 90 days of intense physical exercise, you're gonna come out on the other end looking like a supermodel. <laughs> Whatever. It's been going pretty good so far, but there's, uh, there's definitely one DVD that's come to make me sort of uncomfortable. It's a yoga DVD. <laughs> I know it's LA and you guys probably all do yoga, but if you're a man and you're doing yoga, you need to stop it immediately because it's very dangerous. <laughs> serious. The reason why I say that is last Tuesday night I was in my man cave and I was doing P90X yoga and it was going along really good until I got to this move called uh, Crouching Tiger Hidden Penis. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and show you so you don't get involved in the same trap. Basically what you do, you got to drop down low, hands go on the floor, ass is in the air. You can see the problem already, right, because your penis is really close to your face and your butt. And, and for a guy with two legs, it's real dangerous. And for a, a dude with one leg, it's like fucking suicidal. <laughs> and like last Tuesday in my man cave, like I almost sexually assaulted myself. <laughs> you know, the, the yoga's going on and I slipped and fell, the fake leg gave out and I ended up in a heap on the floor. 
I come to and there's like man parts like right here. It's not funny. So yes, yes, I was blown up in Iraq. Yes, yes, yes. Things are, things, are, things are better now. You know, a lot of guys, when they get blown up, they question, you know, things like religion, you know, how could this happen to me? I really don't do that. You know, I was raised, uh, I was raised Baptist. Any Baptists here? Yeah. <laughs> and my grandparents, I call them violently Baptist. I took a lot of beatings for a lot of shit that I didn't do. I, you, you know, three of the main things, you can't dance, you can't drink alcohol, yeah, and you can't have sex before marriage. What? You know, I met my wife three years ago, and she's Catholic. And so it was right then when I learned the hypocrisy of religion, because not only do Catholics drink alcohol, they get drunk. And they dance. Most of the time, they dance while they're getting drunk. <laughs> now, the whole sex before marriage thing, eh, it's still kind of a gray area. But if you do decide to do it, they don't believe in contraception, so you don't have to wear a condom. So it means it feels a lot better, which brings me to my next point. Six months ago, I had my first baby. <laughs> True story, true story. There's a lot of stuff that they don't tell you when you have children. Like if you're at the hospital, they don't send a nurse home for the first two years of that kid's life to show you that change diapers. And like, there's things I wanna, I wanna know. Like how do you get shit out of suede? I don't know. If your baby throws up, what do you do? What do you do? You can't just take them back. Your wife fires that kid out of the birth canal and then they're, they're hustling you to the door, like waving goodbye, like try not to kill your kid, fuckers. <laughs> For those of you that don't have kids and you're planning on it, be advised that for the first three months of that baby's life, they're gonna shit what looks like seeds. Seedy shit, like sesame seeds. It like totally freaked me out. I was like, man, this kid's like sick. But we didn't like check with the doctor. What I did is I came to the same conclusion that probably all of you would do. It's gotta be magic poop, right? Yes. So what did I do? I took about 1,400 of those diapers and I buried them in my backyard. It's now April, I'm thinking about May time, I'm gonna have a nice little cabbage patch out there. <laughs> this is kind of off topic, but do you all think that there's a possibility that somewhere in Iraq right now, there's a terrorist with my leg? <laughs> You're like, hey, Lieutenant Rice, I got your dead leg. <laughs> I got your dead leg. <laughs> this little terrorist went to the bomb store. This little jihadi went boom. <laughs> Your little toes are no longer ticklish. I'll have 76 virgins soon. <laughs> That's all I got, guys. Thanks a lot. Oh, man. That was the best I've ever seen you do. Really? How did it feel? That was fun. That was good. I threw that new one in at the end. I thought they'd get some like shock value. It's like it's good to be done, but like I said, I could definitely go back up and do some more. Yeah, it's good. It's yeah, good night. Give a big hand, Joe Kosh Kesta. Kesta, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Ah, oh, thank you very much. Um, I find when I meet people, I like to tell them right away that I'm an amputee. But I want to tell them in kind of a fun way so they're not creeped out by it. Like last night, I was out at a bar and I was hitting on this girl. And I looked at her and I said, hey, I've got a foot and a half. <laughs> she was impressed. <laughs> and I said, would you like to see it? And she was intrigued. And I reached down and I started to unzip my pants from the bottom of the cuff. She was excited. And then she was very disappointed. <laughs> and then we went home, and she was really disappointed. <laughs> but I find every time I go out and I pick up a girl and I take her home, invariably, she won't get along with my wife. <laughs> she causes me no end, of, no end of strife there. I should explain, I guess, that uh, my wife's actually bisexual. And she's made it very clear to me, since I travel a lot doing this comedy, that um, if while I'm away, if I pick up another girl, that's fine as long as I call her and tell her about it. And she says it seems only fair because while you're away, I'll be sleeping with other women. There's no punchline, I'm bragging right now. Hey. 
Um, but after my injury, I came home and uh, I did a limb salvage attempt and almost two years later they amputated. And I talked to the doctors and I said that uh, since I'm Jewish and my religion is very important to me, I'd like to have my leg returned so I can have it buried. And they agreed. And it's now buried in my hometown of Baltimore, in a lovely little grave. Oh. From Baltimore? Yeah. Sorry to hear that. <laughs> it's buried in a very lovely little grave with a nice little uh, gravestone. And it says, here lies a bit of Joe. <laughs> 78 to 2005, more to come. But about a month and a half ago, I had to have emergency surgery to have my gallbladder removed. And I had to go back to the grave and now dig like a laundry chute into it. <laughs> and now it just seems I'm constantly going there and chucking stuff in, the gallbladder, my wisdom teeth, my hair, my sanity, that thing's filling up quick. And basically what it is, is I found a way to die on an installment plan. Because <laughs> I mentioned I'm Jewish and I'm offended paying full price for anything. <laughs> I was just for my Israeli friend right there. Um, I am actually a professional Jew. Professional, like as any other kind, right? I mean, come on, you're not gonna find a Jew who's a plumber, or an electrician, or any other type of union skill, like, um, I don't know, carpenter. Well, that was that one guy. And uh, we recently discovered in, in uh, one of our secret meetings that Jews have, um, the, the issue that we had with him, it wasn't what he was preaching, it was, hey, this guy wants us to work for a living? I'm trying to become a fakakta accountant here, I ain't lifting a hammer. But like I said, I am a professional Jew, and um, I found a way that uh, is going to work really well with American culture to make money, and I'm writing a uh, book on how to lose weight. And I'm very excited about this project, it has guaranteed success rate, requires no diet, and no special exercise. Essentially, each chapter is another bit or body part you don't need. <laughs> I lost 25 pounds when I had my foot off, four and a half ounces when I had my gallbladder out, and thanks to internet porn, I lose a full ounce a day. <laughs> and let me tell you, taking that stuff to the grave is exhausting. Thank you very much, that's all my time. I wanted to tell the audience to shut up. They were laughing too fucking much. And I was like, I'm gonna run out of time. You guys gotta be quiet. So, so were you nervous at all? Uh, yeah, I, I always am. I, I was talking a lot of game earlier, but now I'm always terrified to go on stage. Oh, I, I just got laughed, so I'm not, I'm not going to bed and I'm, I'm up and wired and this is, this is awesome. He is a very funny man. Uh, his name is Bobby Henlon and how he introduced himself to me was, I'm a well done comic. Please welcome Bobby to the stage. You should see the other guy. <laughs> you see, it's actually a rare birth defect. You see, yeah, unfortunately for myself and my brother, my mother had to work through her pregnancy at the circus as a fire eater. <laughs> now she thinks she has a right to complain to me about her acid reflux. <laughs> I mean, obviously I came out a light-skinned burnt guy. My poor brother, he just came out. I remember my brother first came out, he sat the whole family down. He was like, I'm gay. I'm like, no shit, Captain Obvious. <laughs> I've been playing with Barbie since you were like six years old. My dad took it the worst. He's just pacing back and forth, like, walk it off, son, just walk it off. <laughs> my mom was actually happy. She was relieved because she was afraid, you know, he was gonna say he was Catholic. Uh, like I said, I was in the army. I did four tours in Iraq. Thank you. Yeah. Crazy, it took me four tours and an IED just to figure out my lucky number was three. <laughs> Over the last five years, I've had 45 skin graft surgeries. Now, I don't know if you guys know what skin graft surgeries are, but basically they take the good skin and replace the burnt skin. 
Like essentially they make a skin quilt out of you. I've had so many skin grafts, I can't tell my ass from my elbow these days. It's ridiculous. <laughs> like for instance, they took my stomach and they put it on top of my head. Now I got a big lint out of my ears. <laughs> I get a headache when I eat too much. <laughs> that's not even the worst of it. I got a butt face. <laughs> taint lips. <laughs> And I have to manscape my crotch eye. <laughs> Which is obviously the left one, it's uncircumcised. <laughs> Do you know how hard it is to walk around cockeyed all day? <laughs> but it's all about the positive, right? Look at the plus side of things. Ladies, if you're a multitasker, which most of you claim to be, with one long, sweet, passionate kiss, you can blow me and toss my salad. <laughs> it's all about having a good time, right? You gotta have a good positive. I love messing with people. I love going to CVS, like Walgreens. I'll get a hand basket full of scar removal. <laughs> I just wanna see the look on the cashier's face. I think that's enough. Or you go to the fireworks stands during Fourth of July. <laughs> Sparklers! Fire rockets! Give me the same shit you gave me last year, it's great! <laughs> Thank you everybody, my name's Bobby Allen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again for the uh, the internet porn joke. That was awesome. I loved it. I saw the very end. He was he was on fire. <laughs> that was only your third time on stage. Third time on stage. Second comedy club. Really? Yeah. We need to uh, maybe relax a little. You were killing. You wouldn't even know it. Come on, sit down. I'll tell you a story. I've been in business in here for 33 years. My first comedian on the stage was Richard Pryor. You know, I said to Richard Pryor one time, I said, Richard, what make a good comedian? You know what he said to me? 10 years of stage time. And Burnett was telling me how short time you, be, you guys have been doing it, how wonderful you are. You're gonna get surprised. Some little surprise. Okay. Right now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Right. I would love to have you guys to headline all five of you come headline in Chicago. I'll fly you to Chicago, you go on, you get paid for it like headliners, and the same time I'll take you to Vegas to do Vegas because you guys deserve, I love what you guys do. I think if you decided to do comedy, you have a great professional ahead of you, you're gonna be the greatest, you could do it. I still don't think of, at least what I'm doing is being good, it's just like, this opportunity I have right now, and then it's gonna to come to an end and then it'll be done. And then Jamie Masada, the owner of the Laugh Factory, he didn't see it like that. He saw it as more of a thing that you could do permanently. It was great, you know, it just made you feel real good inside. Everybody killed that night. Doris, Joe, Steve, everybody just did great. The audience was laughing. It wasn't like, oh, we feel sorry for these kind of warriors, we're just gonna laugh. They were laughing because it was funny. Last night I was on stage and the room was packed and I loved every second of it. Um, I, I even loved hanging out by the bar as people were leaving and there was no room to move around. And it was a great experience. And if it had been anything other than my having performed at a comedy club, I would have been freaking out and have run outside and not been willing to come back in the building. When I got off stage, I didn't seem to feel any pain. I knew my legs still hurt, but it was like I was on a narcotic. It hurt, but I didn't care. I can now kind of laugh at things that used to just make me cry. And uh, so now it's, it's like, you know what, I can, it, it's kind of been like a release. It's like I used to be really bitter about a lot of things about my injury and how I was treated. And, and now, you know, I can uh, incorporate it into my act and laugh about it. Comedy Warriors is amazing for so many of not just the soldiers, but so many people to see that regardless of what you go through, you can do 
anything. You always feel better after you laugh. I have never met anybody that said they felt worse after they laughed, ever. Helping people laugh, helping people get out of their dark spaces is, is wonderful, and doing that to help me get out of my own is, is, is a gift and it is a dream, and it's, it's just been wonderful. He'll finish the show, and it may take him an hour to leave the arena because so many people identify, not just, oh, he's a hero, but look what he's done, and I lost my son, or my son's injured. It takes away some of the sadness of what I went through with the loss of my, and it helps you. Talking to that person, you realize you just helped them. Yes. They, they came through that night through the comedy to laugh at it and to have you relate to them in some way, shape or form. It helps them, and, and that's what it's about. And I figure that's the best kind of revenge I can get on the guy who did this to me for my buddies. If I can go around the rest of my life sharing my story and helping others better their lives, if I can help more people than he's ever hurt or killed, that's the best kind of revenge I can get, and I'm going to continue on with that mission. I can park wherever I want. Hey, Rob, I can park in your front lawn, and I'm not going to get a ticket. You know why? Because cops don't like to give cripples tickets. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> you know, you're somewhere wondering what I look like before. I always tell everybody, it's kind of mixed between Vin Diesel and Spock. Now it's more like, hey, you guys. <laughs> I was in the convenience store at the hospital this one time, and I was in line. And I was behind this guy with his arm in a cast, and he's talking to his friend. And he's saying, oh, this cast sucks so much. It's so itchy. I hate it. And I get on the smuggest look I can manage on my face, and in my smuggest voice, I say, yeah, sucks to be you, bro. <laughs> and he turns around and he's like, oh, oh. I'm like, yeah, that's right. And from behind me, I hear, yeah, sucks to be you, bro. I'm like, who the hell? And I turn around, and there's a quadruple amputee standing right behind me. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> then behind him, there was a head in a jar. <laughs> so, I don't know how that guy got there, but he wins. Hands down. <laughs>